So welcome to worship at Hilden United Church, part of Clifton Pastoral Charge. A special welcome to those who are joining us by way of video tomorrow. Nice to see Rich here today doing the taping. Uh, so uh, to begin with today, I, I want to know if there are any announcements that uh, you'd like to make. Uh, how did we do on the... Uh, got it right here. Yeah, all right, there we go. It was a success. We Thanks. sold out yesterday afternoon, about mid-afternoon, and rough estimate, we made approximately $741. Wow. But I'll have, have, Frank will have to check my figures. Uh, and thank you to all those that worked. Uh, I know most of you worked harder than I did at it. I was doing other things, but anyway, thank you, everybody. And we'll right. do it again next year. That's just... <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, Frank. I'm on the uh, committee for a uh, nomination committee. And Barry, I know with the, we don't have that many meetings anymore. And I'm going to put the slate of office for 221 for 222 in the, in the bulletin. And if anybody changes their mind and doesn't want to be on all those committees, just let me know. Okay. So that's the best we can do because we haven't got it. Room to pick, too many to pick from. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. But I must say, uh, when I came today, uh, it's not often I get here after everybody else, but it was hard to find a parking spot today. You know. I mean, what I, I was I was saying to Bob, what a what a great uh, problem to have. You know. <laughs> anyway, very good. Nice to see you all here today. Uh, yes. The figures for M and S are in the bulletin, but. I want to tell you for Kelvin, in November you donated $395 to m and and we are now up $650 over last year. That's just wonderful, I know. And my little pink wing over there, we have 67% of it filled in, so I know I'll be covering my fingers after next, next month. It's wonderful. So All right, very good. Oh, it's wonderful. You too. Very good. Uh, uh, this week in Old Barnes, we read the mission and service uh, announcement that was read here last week, I think, which was about the uh, special gifts for vaccinations around the world, whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, we're, we're, we're doing okay, folks. We're doing okay, better than okay. We're doing great. Very good. Yeah. Just wanted to say how nice the church, the church looks. Thank you to the worship it, it it does. It looks awesome. It looks awesome. I, I love. Uh, 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 was this Paul Devoe? I think uh, made this uh, crash here. So that that is terrific. And uh, yeah, very very nice. And actually everything very very nice. N nicely decorated. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Yes, Gail. We're still collecting for a Christmas index, but I'm going to have to cut it off after next week because they want the stuff in early. So if you are going to donate something, try to have it here by next Sunday. Right. Just in the red bin out back. If anyone wants to make a monetary um, donation, a check made out to Christmas index, um, I can drop that off as well. Thank okay. You and thank you to the people who've already put mittens and things on the tree up there because those go there as well. All right. Terrific. Terrific. Okay, thank you. Christmas spirit is alive and well. Very good. How about birthdays and anniversaries? We had a, a couple in Old Barnes, uh, Barb's birthday coming up, and uh, Anthony just had his 59th, Anthony Bois. Uh, any, any, any here, any birthdays or anniversaries that you'd like to share? Yeah? Oh, that's right. My, my grandson, Liam. <laughs> Tomorrow, he'll be seven. Seven? No, six. Six. He'll be six. <laughs> no, yeah, he will be seven. That's right. Okay. All right. Yeah. He'll be seven. He'll be seven. All right. We have a grandson who will be 
six on the seven. <laughs> <laughs> so seven on the six and six on the seventh. Got it. Got it. All right. All right. We have a granddaughter that was eight on the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and my oldest granddaughter will be 15 on the 9th. Oh, the 9th. All right. Okay. So we're having fun with this. All right. Very good. Very good. good. Okay. Well, happy birthday to all of these folks. All right. So would you stand with me now as you're able and uh, uh, join me with the statement of reconciliation. And then after that, you can have a seat for the candle lighting service. Long before those of us who are settlers and those of us who are, are descendants of settlers came to this land, there were already people here. Many nations of people lived and live on the land that we call Canada, given responsibility by the Creator to be the first stewards of this land and all that lives on it. We know these people as indigenous. Today, Today we, remember we remember what it, what it means to, to live, live thankfully. thankfully. Let, let us give thanks, thanks for the indigenous people of this land, and let, let us remember that we worship God on the historic and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. As Christ's people, let us be people of love, of truth, and of reconciliation. Let's be seated. Walaliok. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Today we remember the shepherds, workers for the common good, steadfast watchmen isolated and alone, far from the warmth of home, doing the job no one wants. And yet God saw them, God valued them, and God declared the greatest news of all to them alone. Today, we give thanks for all the shepherds among us, essential minimum wage laborers on whom our economy stands. Those we overlook or rarely see, yet rely on for our very survival, the ones who have much to teach us about watching for God in the darkness. On this second Sunday in Advent, we light the second candle, a candle of peace. It's a symbol of the shepherds, agents of the gospel and redeemers of the world, may shalom, peace with justice grow. So our first big hymn today is There is a Voice in the Wilderness, crying number 18 in Voices United, and I invite you to stand at your able for that. Like 
like a dream away. But the word of our God endureth, whose arm is ever strong. God stands in the midst of nations and soon will right the wrong. God shall sheep the flock like a shepherd, the lamb so gently hold. To pastures of peace will lead them and bring them safe to fold. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, a call from the ways untrod. Prepare in the desert of highway, the highway for our God. The valley shall be exalted, the lofty hills brought low. So today is the second Sunday of the season of Advent and a day when we usually traditionally have focused on peace. But of course, peace can mean all kinds of different things. There's peace in our hearts. There's peace in, some, in the sense of the absence of violence. There's peace in terms of forgiveness and reconciliation. And then there's a more peace between nations, a global peace. And we're going to be talking about one of them a little bit later on through the scripture readings. But right now, I wanted to talk to you about the peace of Christ. Now, often when we celebrate communion, and we haven't really done this much here uh, since I've arrived, but uh, there is a, a, a tradition of, it's called passing the peace. And it goes like, may the peace of Christ be with you, and, and the response is, and also with you. And you know that, you know that tradition. And uh, uh, in my last place where I was, we used to do a greeting on most every Sunday at the beginning of the service, and it's hard to do that now when you can't kiss and you can't shake hands and wherever else. But uh, I mean, for a while we went to uh, namaste, may the spirit in me greet the spirit in you. But uh, so it's, it's kind of nice to greet each other. But the peace of Christ, we always used to do on communion Sundays, especially. Uh, I was mentioning to the folks in Old Byron's this morning that one of my friends and colleagues who I went through school with way back in the 80s was settled in Burgio in Newfoundland. And he told me, you know, one of the things that's different about the church there in the 80s anyway, was that not a lot of people seem to take communion when it's offered. Uh, and I said, well, oh, why is that? And he said, well, when you talk to them, some of them say, well, they're not, they don't feel really good enough, you know, to take communion. And my response has always been to that, well, you know, Jesus dipped his bread in the dish with Judas on the night he was betrayed. So being perfect or sinless shouldn't be a, a, a reason not to take communion. But for a long time in the church, an ancient tradition has been this tradition of passing the peace, which is an act of reconciliation. I mean, every church, every organization, there are people that kind of get out of sorts with each other. You know, uh, it happens in families, it happens in every grouping, and the church is no exception. And so the peace of Christ was meant as an opportunity for people to say, you know what, peace be with you. And implying, I forgive you, or at least I'd like to be reconciled with you. And it doesn't always happen. I mean, it's not always possible. But at least the attempt at trying to be reconciled with each other. And it comes from a little piece of scripture in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, where it talks about if you have a gift to bring to the altar and you are at odds with your fellow church member, your, your brother and sister in Christ, then if you can, first put your, put your gift to one side and go and make peace, the peace of Christ with your fellow church member. Then after that's done, bring your gift to the altar. And it's done, we, we, we say this because reconciliation is our business. 
Reconciliation and relationships of love and caring and forgiveness are what we are all about. Between ourselves, our families, our friends, our church, our world, that's what we are supposed to be about. And so uh, the peace of Christ, that's a little bit of the background uh, of may the peace of Christ be with you. And I'm going to give you an opportunity right now uh, not to touch each other, but to actually turn to each other and wish each other the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ And with each other. <laughs> may the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you, George. And also with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. All right. So we're out of practice a little bit, right? You know, maybe, maybe we'll start doing this more often, maybe even regularly. All right. The scripture this morning is taken from Luke 3, verses 1 to 14, the proclamation of John the Baptist. In the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria, and Trachonotus, and Licentius, the ruler of, of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Aeneas and Sathias, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It is written, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet of Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from the stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In the reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? 
He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from, every, from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. And through the reading of this scripture, may you hear the word of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I've been living with this scripture all week, and uh, just as it was read now by somebody else, it something new kind of hit me. It, and the, the part that stuck out to me just in the reading was how repentance alone is not, a, just saying you're sorry without changing things doesn't, is not good enough. You need to actually, if you're truly sorry, you'll actually try to change some things. So we don't want to be like the brood of vipers uh, that just say the words but not do anything else. So shalom more than an absence of violence. In the past couple of weeks, I've seen some news reports around this time of year, they give them about how many murders and how, many, how much violence there's been in Canada. And it seems that this year we set a record, or pretty close to it, for the number of murders. And I'm sure port a pic had something to do with that. But over and above that, the statement that violence is increasing, people kind of confined in their houses, so domestic violence and all kinds of things are up. And uh, that's not a good record to break. There's anything but peace in our country and maybe even in the world because of course, uh, you know, that war that was supposed to end all wars years ago didn't. There's been a lot more wars since then and even in today, even in the world today. Hatred, violence, war between nations, between different races of people and ethnicities, between men and women on domestic fronts, between people of different religions, between people who are dominant gender and orientation to those who are more of a minority, uh, there's all kinds of different ways that we make our differences into us and them and see that as the cause of so much violence and lack of peace in our world. You know? And we see our differences as the cause and not a reason to celebrate how interesting life is because we're not all the same. You know? Wouldn't it be nice, people think, in their minds, if we were all alike and all the same? Then we wouldn't have so much unrest and lack of peace, you know. Well, that, I'm not so sure, is the, the right analysis of the problem. What are the real causes of violence and lack and, and crime in our world? I don't think it's really just because we're different, you know. And in some ways, uh, you know, conspiracy theories may not be completely wrong in every sense and in every case, because there's a little part of me that suggests that we are divided and distracted and divided and conquered by the people who really hold the power in this world, and they go on and do what they're doing while we end up fighting amongst ourselves as a human beings because of our petty differences, you know. This is the second Sunday of Advent, and so our today, our focus is on peace and the things that make for peace in the world in particular. I mean, the Bible uh, has both individuals and think talks about the community, but we, when we think of peace, often we think of, you know, being at peace or peace in our hearts, but the biblical notion of peace for the most part is about peace and relationships with individuals, among families, and nations, and between nations. It's more of a corporate 
understanding of peace. You know? So what do we need, what do we really need to get peace in the world? As I reflect on the Bible, the biblical story, and my own life, in, in, in my lifetime, I see two very different analyses of what's wrong and what to do to make it right. Uh, in, you know, there are two different ones that, that come up all the time. Those of us who are rich understand the problem of violence and crime as a one of lawlessness and the solution to being educating. We need to tell people what's right and wrong and get them to obey it, if not because they want to, but because of threat of, 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 of punishment. And so therefore we need more police as a deterrent and for enforcement. That's why one group of people think there is a problem and that there is no peace. The idea of defunding the police to these folks is a nightmare because that would make things so much worse. Those of us who lived in gated communities and privileged lives and privileged parts of the world think that we need law and order to maintain things as they are. On the other hand, there are those who see the root problem of violence and the lack of peace in the world as one of injustice, you know, uh, inequality and injustice. And let me tell you a little bit of a story. When I worked uh, in the late 70s, early 80s in the prison system in northern Alberta, it didn't take me very long to realize that the prisons, at least the provincial prisons, were full mostly of people who were poor. Poor. You know, people who had no stake in society that I knew, uh, at, at, that worked for me. People who had little or no hope of ever making it other than taking the little bit of money they had and spending it on a lottery and maybe they might strike it rich. But they basically were people without status or an ability to make it and had little hope of doing so. And so, you know, other than fear of punishment, why would the poor and the oppressed obey the laws? They weren't serving them. And when they failed and we get angry at them, uh, you know, we don't think about them doing what they needed to do just to survive. And of course, Jean Valjean comes to mind, buying, stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. At least in provincial institutions, the most common crime that's committed is break and enter. People who don't have enough to live on and so they want to get some. Many of the inmates that were incarcerated where I was in northern Alberta uh, were there because A, they couldn't hire a good lawyer to get them off, or a uh, uh, or B, because they didn't have money to pay their fines. They were actually in prison because they didn't have any money to pay fines. And of course, they put them in prison so that as a deterrent for people who might be tempted not to pay their fines to pay them, right? Even though these folks, for the most part, didn't have any money to pay their fines. And it was costing more to keep them in jail than any kind of amount of time they would do to work off some fines, so many dollars a day. You know? It, it's crazy. It was crazy. I guess the moment of clarity came to me right around this time of year, around 1980. On, in my caseload, I had an inmate who is indigenous who came to me and said this, Mr. Kennedy, do you think you could pull some strings for me so that I could stay in jail over Christmas? I'd like to stay here because back on the reserve, you know, it's, it's kind of cold and we won't have anything to eat and, and, you know, being here is better than being there. Do you think you could pull some strings for me? And by the way, you could write a, a description of a jail that would make it sound like the Holiday Inn, you know. Uh, they have a gymnasium, they get three square meals a day, they got TV, you know, all kind. I mean, the, the, people make, sound, make prison sound like it's an easy life, but think of being locked up in a confined space with people who hate themselves, hate everybody else, and hate the world. And how, what kind of hell that can be. And yet this person wanted to stay in that situation rather than go home to the reserve 
because the reserve and he were poor, were poor. You know. The prisons and law and order and violence are often the result of desperation and poverty. Again and again in the scriptures, the prophets, including John the Baptist that we read today, they come down on one side of this debate. The real source of the problem and the solution of peace is not because people break the law and we need more enforcement, but it's injustice. It's injustice. At least everyone needs to have their basic needs met. And I'm so happy we're doing so well with mission and service and that you folks are such a generous group. But the word shalom doesn't mean just the absence of violence in the world, where the lion lies down with the lamb and we take our swords and we beat them into plowshares, but it's the presence of equality, where notions of rich and poor really don't make sense anymore and where everyone has at least enough and where nobody takes more than they need. And that's the kind of vision we've been singing about so far today and we'll be singing about again. And so the prophets Isaiah and the other prophets, Micah, Amos, John the Baptist, later Mary in the Magnificat that is often read during the season of Advent, you know, in her, her song of, uh, of joy, talk about this kind of leveling that needs to happen. I mean, that's the, the metaphor that's used is of leveling, you know, from here to here, from here down to here. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and all the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. What a great metaphor for inclusion and equality. Shalom is not just peace, is peace in our hearts as individuals. It's really about salvation, and salvation is for everybody, or it's not really for any of us. You know, this pandemic and climate change both have showed us how interconnected we are with all things and all people. We are really all one, as much as we would deny it. So whatever else Jesus of Nazareth was, he was in the line of these prophets of Isaiah and John the Baptist calling for repentance and calling for a return to that original vision of the God who sided with those slaves in Egypt against oppression and wanted to make them uh, a little more equal in terms of their power and participation in the world, you know. The good news of Jesus was addressed especially to the poor and it was focused on the whole notion of the acceptable year of the Lord that every 50th year, 49th and 50th year, there would be this time when there would be somebody that would push the reset button and things would go back to the way they were at the beginning of the origin of Israel, which was where everybody had land and grew crops and could feed their own families and, and so on, and not one person having it all and somebody else having to go into indentured slavery in order to survive. You know, because every system, whatever system we have, sooner or later inequalities creep in, and so we need a reset button. We need a reset button every so often. And Jesus was saying, this is the year. This is the time. All of your sin, all of your debt will be forgiven. We need to proclaim that and enact that. And one of the things that kind of frustrates me sometimes about the Lord's Prayer, which has become traditional in the United Church, uh, is that we use the word trespasses, you know, forgive us to stay our, tra I mean, trespass to me means, you know, there's a sign that says don't trespass and you jump over the fence anyway and go hunt or do whatever you're going to do, you know, but it doesn't have a lot of other meaning for us. But in Matthew and Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, which are the only two versions we have in the canonical Gospels, it doesn't say trespasses. It says sins and debts. Forgive us our sins and those who sin against us. Forgive us our debts, you know. And in the original language of Jesus, Aramaic, hamartia is the word that's used, and it meant both of those things, sin and debt, because of course, when you committed a sin, you incurred a debt against God. 
And the way to, to get rid of that was to make restitution uh, by, by giving a sacrifice at the temple and you know, getting rid of that sin and so on. So sin and debt are kind of in there. And so Jesus was totally upsetting the, the establishment so by telling people your sins and your debts are forgiven. You know, your sins and your debts are forgiven. And that those sins and those debts were in part because of the Roman taxation, but also the temple taxation, and because of a religion which basically said it was okay to ignore the poor and have some social advantage over others. You know, the religion of the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the scribes, you know. And Jesus was rebelling against all of that to say, look, we were, all of us want shalom. All of us want shalom, and the way to do that is by saying, hit the, hit the reset button. We need to forgive and get on with it. In terms of peace and shalom, this Jesus whose birthday we're going to be celebrating soon declares that true and lasting peace demands for forgiveness and reconciliation of ourselves and others and, on the other hand, canceling the injustice of debt for the poor. So there you have it on this Peace Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent. If you really want peace in the world, military and police action, in Jesus' time, victory, you know, Caesar Augustus declared and actually wrote big things on, in, in, on walls uh, on, the, on the shores of the Mediterranean that says, I am the Prince of Peace. I have declared, I have peace in our time. I, you know, I'm, I'm the maker of peace because he had defeated the people in the civil war in Rome. And his way of peace was through violence and through, through force. But of course it didn't last. And that's the same way with any, any kind of peace that's brought about by force. It'll last as long as, as you kind of keep your, your thumb on the, on the people but as soon as you turn your back, it'll break out again, or even if, you know, it, it will. That's not shalom. No, uh, I had these, you know, you know I'm colorblind, right? So these candles are purple, right? Down here, okay. So they're, they're purple there for a reason. Because as we are involved in this season of preparation, the season of Advent, Confession is part of the way that we prepare for the celebration of Christmas. And so I want to invite you now to join me in a prayer of confession as we end this message. Loving creator of all creations and all peoples, rich and poor, we confess that we've become desensitized a little bit to the needs of others around us and on TV, and we've insulated ourselves from compassion. We've kind of had to do that because there's so much need and we live in such an unjust world. But keep us mindful of the real reason for the season, shalom, peace on earth, the birth of Jesus who proclaimed Jubilee. We give more at Christmas time to honor the compassion of the one born in the stable, but we've become content a little bit with charity and place of real justice for all. We, 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 we like how it makes us feel, even though it's kind of the first steps towards making restitution. Help us rekindle your hope and your vision. We confess that sometimes we resent pressures of Christmas, gift giving, financial stress, gatherings with family that aren't always enjoyable, the need for everyone, the need to be happy when sometimes we don't feel that way. Show us, God, how we need to change things both in our hearts and in our relationships, and keep us from the cynicism that says that nothing ever changes. We ask these things in the name of Jesus and for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Now, because 
John the Baptist said, don't just say prayers of confession, but actually do something, show things. I'm going to make a suggestion to you today on how you actually can do something to bring about a little more peace in the world. This past week, there was uh, a thing that came out from the United Church that alerted my attention to the fact that in Prince Edward Island, they want to try an experiment. They want to try something called guaranteed livable income. And every single political party over there is on board for this. And there's about 80 senators in the Canadian Senate that are on board with this. And so what they have asked and what the church is asking us to do is to be in touch with our member of parliament to say, Canada, as a country, get aboard this experiment that Prince Edward Island is doing. And so if, if you want to honor this Peace Sunday in Advent, I'm suggesting that's one way at least you might consider doing that this year. Calling your MP, writing your MP and saying, get on board Canada, you know, to this experiment that Prince Edward Island wants to try. When you think of uh, Medicare, in our country. It started with one province, right? It started with Saskatchewan. That's how it started. And then when the rest of the country saw how well it was doing in Saskatchewan, we said, we need to do this nationally. So maybe we could try this in PEI and see where it goes because that kind of meeting of basic needs for everybody may be the, a real step forward in terms of shalom, of peace. Oh, man. Blessed be the God of Israel who comes to set us free, who visits and redeems us and grants us liberty. The prophet spoke of mercy, of freedom and release. God shall fulfill the promise and bring the people peace. Now from the house of David, a child of grace is given. A Savior comes among us to raise us up to heaven. Before him goes a herald or runner in the way, the prophet of salvation. So on the Clifton Pastoral Charge website, uh, or maybe even by charge email, you will be getting uh, a link that will help if you want to do a written uh, thing to, to your MP that comes out from the United Church. So uh, Leslie's going to send it out. So I invite you now to join me in our prayers, the prayers of the people. Let us pray. God of Shalom, loving Creator God, we come today acknowledging that peace in the world is still not a reality. We do want to give thanks and praise, however, wherever it does break forth because of your spirit and the life and love that enables transformation of hearts and lives. Where there has been hatred and anger, we give thanks for forgiveness and reconciliation. May there be more of it. Where there is unrest of spirit, we give thanks for those who help us feel that peace of Christ in our souls. And for you, help those of us who are still struggling. Where there is hope 
amid despair, we give you thanks. Give us the gift of faith to believe in light even when there is darkness all around. O oh God, this pandemic is still with us, knocking us down every time we think we might get our legs underneath us. Give us strength and persistent and wisdom to fight the evil of this disease and others. We thank you for doing that already. We pray for healing for those struggling with cancer and other diseases as well. We pray for those trying to adjust to losses and disappointments. Help us all with the grieving process and use our grief to make us more compassionate towards others in similar situations. We pray as well for things that have been on our radar for a while now. Things like climate change, things like flooding in Cape Breton and Newfoundland and British Columbia. We pray it doesn't get any worse and we ask for speedy repair and cleanup getting things back in order. We pray for an end to racism near and far away, for yes, it is indeed here in Truro and Nova Scotia, in Canada, as well as places further afield. And we pray for an end to the harm that racism causes, whether it's physical harm or mental or spiritual harm. We pray for actions to address climate change sooner than later. We celebrate new life, the birth of babies, celebrations of birthdays and anniversaries and other celebrations in the midst of this apocalyptic time which we seem to be living through. Here now are spoken and unspoken prayers, O oh God and address the deepest needs of our hearts, we pray. I pray for Chris and Carl and Gary dealing with cancer. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, this morning, somebody reminded me of how uh, Presbyterians still, when they say the Lord's Prayer, they use debts and debtors instead of trespasses. Yes, yes. Converting space for a field hospital in Cuba. 11 million people live in Cuba. By mid-July, the country had a staggering average of over 400 confirmed COVID-19 cases per million residents daily double the world average and more than any other country in the Americas for size. Coupled with the continuing and strengthened U.S. economic blockade, Cuba is now experiencing dire economic conditions, shortages of food and medical supplies. The dramatic surge in cases related to the Delta variant have been felt most acutely in locations such as Cardenas, Matanaz, where mission and where Mission and Service Partners, the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue, and Evangelical Theological Seminary are located. When hospitals in Cuba were pushed to capacity, both partners moved quickly to convert their buildings to help. Today, both the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue and the 
Evangelical Theological Seminary are being used as field hospitals and isolation centers for children and their families who have been exposed to the virus. A seminary in Matineas, a team of doctors and nurses, attend to 120 children and their accompanying parents, as well as other individuals who are suspected of having or are diagnosed with COVID-19. Seminary staff work to support the hospital, including providing food for the hospital on a daily basis. This generosity in action is also inspiring others to be generous too. Local business owners and the public have begun to donate food, transportation, masks, and more to the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue. In recent days, we have welcomed representatives of different business in the city to our institution with special contributions, cake, ice cream, jam, graphic prints with hopeful messages, says the center, in a report calling the groundswell of kindness gratifying. Throughout the pandemic, your support through mission and service has helped provide vital personal protective equipment shelter and food for people in Canada and around the world when they need it. Now it is also providing life-saving vaccines. Thank you for all the ways you are making a difference. So thank you for that particular uh, minute for mission. Uh, a few years ago, a group of young people and then a group of young people and adults, we, we made actually two trips to the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue and the seminary in Matanzas. Uh, I know the place well, and uh, they do fantastic work. And of course, Cuba as a whole was suffering terribly, not only from the special period, they called it, when the Russians pulled out all of a sudden, but also the period of the blockade, which politically, uh, people like President Biden will probably keep in place because he needs the votes in Florida from the, from the Cuban community there, Florida being a, a, a swing state. So that doesn't look like it's going to help and change anytime soon, but my hope is eventually that uh, once travel restrictions lift up, we may even have a chance to partner with CCRD of, of take some people from here down there and maybe have some people from down there come up here. Would, that would be awful, awesome because we've already have, uh, at least uh, I have a relationship and uh, Shannon has a relationship with these folks in this, uh, this, this community down there. And uh, they, do, they do terrific work. And of course, this pandemic has made things terrible. You may not know it, but early on in the pandemic, Cuba actually developed five different vaccines early on, and we're spreading them to other Caribbean countries, giving them away to other, other countries in the, in the Caribbean. So you don't hear about that. Anyway, let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all that you've given us gifts of life, gifts of wisdom, gifts of vaccines, gifts of time and talent and treasure. And we pray that whatever we give, you use to bring about your shalom. And we pray and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, uh, if you would stand as you're able and join me in our affirmation of faith, a new creed, it's found halfway down the page on 918 in Voices United, and then you may as well stay standing for our final hymn. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. 
in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And our final hymn, All Earth is Waiting, number five. Says the prophet to those of Israel, a virgin mother will bear Emmanuel, one whose name is God with us, our Savior shall be, through whom hope will blossom once more within our hearts. Mountains and valleys will have to be made plain. Open new highways, new highways for our God, who is now coming closer, so come all and see. And open the doorways as wide as wide can be. In lowly stables the promised one appeared, yet feel the presence throughout the earth today. For Christ lives in our Christians and is with us now. Again on arrival, Christ brings us liberty. So go now from this place as agents of inclusion, equality, social justice as the means of bringing about shalom, lasting peace and as you do so may the grace of Christ attend you the love of God surround you and the Holy Spirit be with you today and always and may the peace of Christ be with you Amen I am walking the path of peace I am walking the path of peace I am walking the path of peace Lead 